World War E is happening right now. It's been happening uh, for quite a while with, with big tech, uh, but now the hacking has started. Hi, I'm Mike Maloney and welcome back. Today, we've got Adam Taggart with us. Adam, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing great, Mike, um, but uh, I think both you and I have been a little bleary eyed following the incredibly fluid situation going on right now. You had had in your video yesterday talking about kind of why Russia feels surrounded here. And you had a, you had a, a, a slide that I hope we can put up here for just a second, where you talked about um, sort of a progression of risks that you saw ahead uh, as things unfold. Uh, it started with trade wars. It then went to currency wars. It went to what you were calling WWE, which I'll come back to in just a second. And then the next was World War III and then this whole AI issue. Uh, the WWE, let's talk more about that for a moment if we can, because we're actually seeing that play out in real time right here. Yeah, you know, and yesterday I <clears throat> did say that, you know, we had already started the trade wars and the currency wars were already happening. And then I said, next is WWE. But, you know, WWE, uh, which is, you know, the electronic, the, this war on the Internet, it's like e-commerce, e this, e that. World War E, I came up with that uh, for my 2018 early warning seminar. And uh, it's uh, something that, you know, is a huge risk. And it's actually the beginning phase of what would could turn into World War E, World War Three, I'm sorry. And we're already there. I mean, this is happening. World War E is happening right now. It's been happening uh, for quite a while with, with big tech, uh, but now the hacking has started. And so, you know, our, the next article that we uh, we're going to look at here is the Moscow Exchange uh, Spurbank website knocked offline. Was Ukraine's cyber army responsible? This is one of the things about electronic warfare, uh, when it's uh, cyber attacks, you get to point the finger at anybody. So you can do a big false flag event if you want. Somebody can whip up a frenzy in their own population by creating an attack on themselves. Uh, this is something very dangerous and you just can't see where it's coming from. So there's, there isn't any proof. I mean, it would take years to unravel uh, something like this. What do you think about it? Yeah, well, I think it's a whole new front on warfare that that we as a society, you know, we 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 don't have a lot of history with it, right? So it's it's really sort of a a brand new weapon in the arsenal that we haven't really figured out how to respond to yet. And you just talked about how it can be uh, not only damaging but deceptive, right? We might not even know who's inflicting uh, the pain, right. um, but it is a reality. And I just I, a very quick dial through the internet show the following um, leading up to this armed conflict in the Ukraine. Um, Ukraine banks and government websites had been hacked, uh, brought down by hackers. Um, malware was uh, placed uh, on the computers of a bunch of other different industries in Ukraine, everything from aviation to the financial system. Um, but also in Russia, since the outbreak uh, of, of Russia, Russia's incursion into the Ukraine, there's the Moscow Stock Exchange, which has gone down, which was the article that you just mentioned. But the FSB website's gone down. That's their major security agency. Uh, the RT, Russia Today, and TASS media sites have been brought down. The Kremlin website was brought down. So, you know, there's there's cyber warfare now on, on both sides of this, this conflict, right? So it's definitely now, you know, a, a new weapon in the arsenal that is being aggressively used. And I just want to put up this one example. Um, it's, it's just a little bit of humor and a very dark subject here. Um, the, uh, the National Electronic Vehicle Charging Network in Russia apparently got hacked so that when you plugged in your, your car to charge it, uh, it said glory to Ukraine on the display there. So uh, just one more way in which, you know, uh, this whole cyber front is being waged. Yeah, it's amazing. And it just, you know, as the world, uh, when you read the book Anti-Fragile, uh, you know, it talks about uh, like free market systems being uh, anti-fragile and something that is a top-down uh, single system, man-made, becomes more and more fragile when it doesn't get stressed. And we've built a global system here that relies, uh, everything relies on the internet. That means our whole society now is super fragile. And, and because 
we protect it from outside shocks and don't figure out how to um, <clears throat> make it robust and survive all of the outside shocks, uh, this whole thing is just becoming very, very dangerous. And we are in the midst of World War E right now. Yeah, and Mike, this is relevant to a, a documentary that you were just telling me about that I actually haven't watched yet, um, but maybe it's worth talking about for a quick second. I believe it's called Zero Days. Yes, I highly recommend everybody watch this and, and just do a search for it. It is available online now. All right, great. Well, you know, in, in, in WWE, there's, you know, the cyber warfare of like bringing websites down and, and the actual attack part of it. But as we sort of mentioned, there's almost sort of a deception element to it or, you know, a, a masking of truth side of it. And right. you've uncovered a couple of, of instances recently of sort of, you know, pretty overt censorship of information, right? I know that there's a, a map yeah. you were telling me that you were trying to get access to that, that you actually had a lot of trouble, right? Well, you know, um, I noticed this uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, the censorship that was going on and the... Uh, they, were try they were trying to control our thoughts to manipulate us. And I had a web browser open uh, with, uh, I believe it was 120 different open tabs. I can't remember the exact amount, but 50 just over 50% of those tweets, uh, videos, all of the information that I was presenting, including uh, web pages, uh, were gone. When I, when I went to actually make a video about it, uh, all of this was gone and I was just astounded at the level of censorship and control that was going on. I had, before that, I really had no idea of how deep it was. And then mysteriously, like, oh, I think it was about nine months or maybe a year and a half even, after all of these pages, uh, were no longer accessible. You'd click a link and Google could not find that page. It wasn't the, the page was gone. Google couldn't find it. Now it was back. <laughs> and so, but who's going to read an article that's uh, 18 months old? Nobody. So here, uh, Dan sent us some uh, tweets. And one of the first uh, tweet was the dynamics of the Russian advance in four days. An interesting few days ahead in Ukraine. But when I clicked on it, this map that's an animated map was not there. And instead, because I was not logged in when I clicked it, it says the following media includes potentially sensitive content. <laughs> this is not, the content was not sensitive whatsoever. Uh, it was just a map showing the areas where the uh, Russian armies had advanced to and so on. And, and presumably one would just call that news, right? Yes, it was news, right. Yet it was being suppressed. Uh, then the next uh, tweet that I clicked on was just a chart. And I clicked on it and it says, hmm, this page doesn't exist. Try searching for something else. And it gives you a search button. And this was interesting because you had to wonder uh, why this is being censored and who it was that uh, is requesting that Twitter censors this because this wasn't just uh, Twitter randomly deciding that they're going to censor something. This was a financial chart of the number of addresses with balances greater than 1,000 Bitcoins. And it, in just the few days, it has uh, just spiked enormously the number of addresses out there. And by the way, uh, 1,000 Bitcoins is currently about $40 million. Now, <clears throat> this is big money, but it's not. this is not the smartest of the big money. The smartest of the big money would be dividing their uh, big purchases that are happening over just the last couple of days into a bunch of separate wallets that were smaller, five, uh, you know, uh, uh, instead of $40 million, half a million dollars each or, or a million dollars each or something like that. Um, but it is astounding, uh, the number of big players that are suddenly rushing toward cryptocurrencies. Right. Well, and so, okay, I think that's a good transition here. Um, so you're sort of talking about the censorship that initially was keeping you from getting access to that data, which is just, again, sort of news data. 
Um, but looking at that massive spike in, in uh, Bitcoin transactions by those big wallets, um, it's hard not to, to think that those may be you know, rich Russians, probably Russian oligarchs, given that you said you know, the size of those wallets are in the tens of millions, um, trying to get capital. Yeah, they're all greater capital. than 40 million. So we greater, have all greater than 40 really million. Yes, so. are. These are balances higher than 1000 bitcoins. Right. So these are people with a lot of money. And, you know, again, presumably if they're Russians, uh, they're in a country that's all of a sudden getting hit with a bunch of sanctions and the Russian government's trying to place capital controls. And so this is presumably capital that's fleeing the country. Right. And I think it's a good segue to just looking at how the ruble is devaluing right now in response to, you know, the West's uh, really the rest of the world's response uh, to Russia and, you know, clamping down with, with tough economic sanctions, uh, cutting off a lot of trade, et cetera. So you've got a chart here, Mike, that, that maybe we can show here, but it shows that, uh, the, the ruble has lost like more than 50% of its value since last week, correct? It's just, it's fallen off of a cliff. And you know what's interesting? Uh, I did several, um, back in, I think 2010, I was speaking at a banking conference in Sochi, Russia. And I presented a chart of the devaluation of the Russian ruble since Peter the Great. <clears throat> so you're talking a few hundred years of uh, robbing their own population. When, when a currency gets devalued, uh, it's, it's a transfer of wealth uh, from the population to the government. And, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, you talk about hyperinflations. If you look at this over a long period of time, I'll put the chart up. I don't uh, have the information right in front of me right this second. I can't. It was like, I don't know, four quadrillion times it had been. <laughs> devalued. It was just crazy. And then this uh, uh, causes that devaluation to basically double again, if this lost 50%. So uh, the Russian people end up suffering from this. And you know, I've been to Russia a few times, and these are some good people. Uh, there's nobody uh, in Russia that particularly hates you or me. And I don't particularly hate any particular person in Russia, and, and I don't wish them ill will. Uh, it's these leaders that cause this. So that's my take on the crash of the Russian ruble. What's yours? Uh, well, very similar to what you said there. And um, we were talking before we got on the camera here, and I was sort of making the comment that, uh, you know, if you look at a number of the large publicly traded Russian resource companies out there, there are major oil, gas, mineral companies, They've lost like 70 to 80 percent of their market value in the past week. Um, I sort of likened it to like a neutron bomb where um, those companies haven't been impaired at all in terms of they've got the same number of wells, the same number of mines, all the infrastructure is still there, all the workers are still there. But a huge amount of the market value has evaporated. And, and, and that's the vulnerability you have um, both, you know, to economic sanctions by the world against your, your, your country. Uh, but when, you're, when your currency devalues that, that quickly, that, that, that's what happens, right? So um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, the it's just what, what, one small example of the crying shame of what's going on there. And of course, we're not even talking about the loss of life that's going on in this whole conflict. Yeah. And the company didn't change. The company is the same. It has the same resources. It, it truly has a fundamental value to it. But the value measured in uh, fiat currencies and the perceived value is suddenly uh, changed dramatically. And it, this ha has a lot of reflection on fiat currencies. In yesterday's video, uh, I talked about an analyst from Credit, Credit Suisse uh, was talking about inside money and outside money. And the inside money is what I call currency or near currency. It's anything that has the, uh, the, that requires the performance of a counterparty. Anything that where your asset is someone else's liability, and this includes uh, the private companies, a share of stock. Uh, but it's the the currencies, and we're just seeing right now in in front of our eyes the devaluation of the ruble, and then the following devaluation of these companies that are that are still i can't imagine what has changed all that much in these companies uh not that much uh so uh the the value evaporating like that is something that can't happen with the ultimate 
Uh, he calls it outside money, outside of the system, but a money that does not require a counterparty to perform. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of its own sovereign value. <laughs> uh, that's a great way to say it. Well, look, I want to talk to you about the ultimate sovereign value uh, gold in just a moment, because there's some interesting things going on there. But real quickly before we do, let's just take one quick little detour around the fiat currency world where uh, there's a lot of speculation right now that because Russia is getting so penalized right now by the rest of the world, that it's going to accelerate its plans and its strategy to try to de-dollarize, which is something it's been working on for a while, as have other players around the world. So Mike, do you think, I know we got an article here to, to quickly look at, um, it's called, Could Russia and China Collectively Challenge the Dollar's Reserve Status, uh, written by the, uh, quote, the Raven folks. Um, but do you think that this is going to accelerate players like Russia, China, et cetera, to try to do more global trade in currencies other than the US dollar? Absolutely. And I have been giving uh, public uh, presentations on the death of the global dollar standard since 2009. And uh, these are what I call the nails in the coffin. And, you know, I, I reported on and kept track of uh, China and Russia uh, making these, you know, this started years and years and years ago. And they've got a lot of things in place to where they're almost ready to launch this. And yes, this will speed it up. But you know, what is even uh, more concerning in this article is the uh, fourth paragraph here. It says that uh, on Sunday, Putin put nuclear deterrence forces on high alert uh, as a response to increasing pressure from NATO. So watch my Why Russia Feels Surrounded video uh, and the fact that he has put the nuclear, his, the nuclear arsenal on high alert. Uh, this is, shows you how dangerous this is. And it shows you the progression. You know, we started with the trade wars, then the currency wars. We are in World War E, and the next step could be World War III. I hope cooler heads prevail. Uh, you know, uh, in my video yesterday, I, I told everybody, the first thing I did this morning, was I watched Pale Blue Dot. Uh, it just, it brings you back and centers you. Uh, and so I just hope we have a really good uh, resolution to this whole thing because it's getting pretty damn scary. Well, from your lips to God's ears there, Mike, on a peaceful resolution happening soon. Um, folks, real quick, um, if you like this video, uh, enjoy conversations like this, um, please hit the like button and subscribe down below if you haven't already. Um, all right, Mike, so I mentioned that we're going to get on to um, that truest form of, of uh, outside money, which is gold. Uh, I want to put up a chart here, which I think is a really important chart. Um, I think we've mentioned it several times over past months that gold has been uh, trading in this compressing wedge or pennant uh, formation for years now, really since 2020. And the speculation has been that it's gonna break out, it was gonna break out soon, and we thought it was gonna break out to the upside, but of course we didn't know. Well, now we actually seem to have confirmation of, a, of an upside breakout. And I just wanna note the chart we're looking at here uh, was taken yesterday. Um, it shows gold around 1917. Uh, here at the moment we're talking, Mike, gold is over 1930 an ounce. It's up 2% wow. for the day. Silver is up 4% of the day. So this breakout is continuing. How do you feel about that? Because I this because I know you've been watching this for a long time. Well, it's, you know, I didn't want to actually see this happening because of these conditions, because of the potential of a world war. Uh, but this was something that, you know, was inevitable. And what this chart doesn't show, you know, what this chart, chart does show is that we have, this is a monthly data chart. And uh, we have just entered the second, you know, we're, we're in the second month now of uh, data where the prices are uh, opening and closing above the, uh, the, this wedge. So it's, it's a confirmation, this, the, the last data point on this chart. But what the chart doesn't show is that this consolidation that's been happening since mid 2020 um, is actually 
the handle of a giant cup and handle formation right. is one of the most bullish formations that there is. And so this should take us in, you know, up uh, way above the, you know, it should take us up a, way above like $2,500. I think that we could be seeing, depends on what happens geopolitically, but we could be seeing somewhere between 5,000 and infinity per ounce. Right, right, right. And, <laughs> you just, and again, you don't maybe, know what's going to happen to fiat currencies. Right. And maybe that's a world we don't want to see if geopolitical right. events are driving it all that high. R real quick question for you on this, which is um, let's hope for a moment that you are right and that we have peaceful resolution coming out of Ukraine at some point soon. Do you think it's likely we could drop back into this range or do you think it's more likely that once we punctured through it, we're going to we're going to remain above it? Well, typically, if it drops back down, what it does is drop back down to the upper trend line and bounce off of it. So yes, so a retest. It's, it's possible that we could go for it. You know, if there was a, a, a peaceful resolution to this and the market started taking off again, then I think uh, gold would do a pullback, but it would retest that upper line of the wedge and bounce off of it. And that just gives us, you know, a little bit larger handle. Uh, it doesn't negate anything, though. Even if it came down, though, and um, uh, tested the bottom support line, it's still bullish. It wouldn't be until, you know, it would have to drop like below 1700 to negate everything and become a bear, you know, a bearish sign or a sign that this handle may take a lot longer to develop. But I have a feeling that, I mean, that, they're going to start losing control of this thing uh, as far as, you know, they've got to manipulate both uh, the uh, political uh, machine. They've got to manipulate uh, your outlook on things, your opinions, and they've got to manipulate the markets and they've got to keep uh, bonds from cratering or going to the moon. They've got to keep interest rates low. They've got to keep un uh, unemployment low. They've got all of these conflicting things and that they've been manipulating for so long that, that the confluence of all the pressures that are built up, there's going to come a day where the, they lose control of all of this stuff. The Federal Reserve, the governments, uh, and you know, every, it's going to be very, very chaotic. Sure does make me comfortable, though, more comfortable than I, I worry about the average person that does not have precious metals and some cryptos. I think this is a balance that you have to have. And we were talking about World War E earlier. I mean, if the Internet isn't working uh, or um, something gets hacked where the on and off ramps for your, your cryptos to go into dollars, because things are still priced in dollars. They're not priced in your house isn't priced in how many Bitcoin it's worth. Uh, and so um, uh, I know that Bitcoin is something that they can't destroy. There will be a way of uh, keeping it going always. But uh, through the, the crisis here, having a balance of precious metals and cryptos, I think is prudent. I, I don't think it's uh, as prudent to be all in one camp or the other. What's your thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, just from a general diversification standpoint, but I think we're seeing for better or worse um, playing out this week, just affirmation of what you just said there, Mike. I, I think people that have owned gold and crypto a week ago are some of the people that have slept the best at night, given all the uncertainty going on, at least as it regards to financial wealth. Um, you know, just putting aside again, the, the, the much more, and I think, important issues in the long run of, of human cost of what's going on right now. Yeah. But I think, you know, I, I think uh, those are the people with the fewest financial regrets over the past week. Um, and, and, and sadly, it's taking an armed conflict to, pri to provide this reminder. But this won't be the only type of trigger like this. I think that, uh, to, you know, in support of what you're saying, uh, to, uh, you know, convince more and more people around the world that, that having those two elements in a portfolio uh, it, it's it, it's just some of the best insurance that you can own against the volatility that's likely ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people think I'm crazy having uh, the vast majority of my net worth in, I mean, for a long, long time, uh, it was all precious metals. Uh, now it's the vast majority is precious metals, but I've got uh, quite a bit of crypto 
And so, um, uh, uh, and I don't have any, I've got some mining companies that were all private placements, but I don't have any uh, uh, of the, what the standard stock portfolio would contain. Um, all right. Yeah. Um, well, Mike, just just moving on from here real quickly, um, relevant to a few things you said earlier, I want to bring up um, our user feedback of the day. Um, and this is from uh, Rob, and I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, Rob Kutch. He says, Mike, thank you. I watched the blue dot. In the context of what's going on around us, I cried. My life has never felt so unstable. Although with the plan B, you and others I follow help to empower me, I also viewed John Mearsheimer's lecture. Isn't it amazing how a factual narrative can change your thinking? The presentation was phenomenal, and your talk a number of years ago on Ukraine was a future trend in the making of the present. Truly intuitive and well done. Appreciate you, sir. And thank you again, Mike. Rob from Denver. Uh, I got to imagine, Mike, that, that he's voicing what a lot of people are thinking right now. Um, how do you feel about that feedback? Uh, this is the reason I continue to do this. Uh, you know, I've been doing it. I started doing presentations back in 2004, started uh, Gold Silver in 2005. Uh, this video channel, the YouTube channel, we started in 2009. And to tell you the truth, I'm tired. I would just love to go and sit up on my mountain at my uh, farm and not look at any of the news ever again. <laughs> this is what keeps me doing it, is when people appreciate the analysis that I, I try, because I try to connect dots for people. That is uh, my thing. And, and I try my hardest never to propagate false information uh, to, to generate or prop propagate um, false information. And, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to help people. I'm trying to help the world economy. I'm trying to, um, <clears throat> one of the reasons for goldsilver.com was to try and save the middle class because it's the middle class that uh, determines uh, where a country goes politically with its vote. And very often in times of great economic stress, they elect some super powerful leader like a Hitler or so they start following. And then there's this swing from uh, uh, individualism to collectivism. And we're going toward this collectivist side. We've already done these experiments and we know the data and we don't have to go back into the socialist experiments of the USSR or Mao's China or, uh, you know, some authoritarian regime like Hitler. Uh, these things have all been tried in the past. And then you see this cycle and you see people trying to sell each other on uh, the, this thinking and it's just dangerous thinking. And so this is the reason I do it. And the reward is uh, people like Rob saying things like this. It's what keeps me going. So thank you very much, Rob. I really appreciate it. Well, well that's great, Mike. And, and just to note something for you here, which is that when you are someone who's telling, trying to do your best to tell people where the puck is headed in the future, um, it can sometimes take years for the puck to get there. <laughs> and not everybody remembers what you were saying years before. And I, I, it's got to be very validating to have folks like Rob that are saying, hey, Mike, I've been paying attention to you. And I remember that this is what you were saying all those years ago. And now you're being proven right. And thank you for giving us that insight years in advance so that we could take you know, prudent action beforehand, right? So, uh, yeah, you thank know you. what's interesting too. You know, I, I talk about the roller coaster crash or the roller coaster, and we are on this economic roller coaster, and it's things are coming faster and faster. You know, it used to sort of uh, go up for a long time and then down and up and down, but now it's just going like this. And with all the political news and everything, it just, it's hard not to let this thing get your head spinning uh, to where emotions take over and you panic and do the wrong thing. Uh, trying to be data-driven and fact-driven and try your hardest to uh, let your opinions be developed from the facts. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing to do, but it's the one thing that I think can bring us out of the other side of this. Uh, you know, with things happening that are good things instead of the worst. I want to thank everybody for watching. Thank you, Adam. 
Always a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Bye.